I'm Tracy Bingaman. I'm a full-time working mom of five who got sick, burned out, quit my job, and now I teach women how to mom smarter, not harder. The pressures of modern motherhood are intense. You're a busy working mom juggling all the balls and living in fear of dropping the exact wrong one. Here you'll find the tools you've been searching for to confidently prioritize your life and optimize your ability to rock all the hats that you choose to wear. I'll show you how to break through your limiting beliefs so you'll have more time and more money than you know what to do with. Because even in the busiest seasons of life, you can grow to master your money, own your time, and be the mom with all the margin. This is Fulfilled as a Mom. All right. Welcome back to Fulfilled as a Mom. Today, we have an awesome guest with us. So Meg, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. So my name is Meg Letty. I am a physician assistant in surgery, and I've been a PA for, goodness, I think 17 years now. Um, I love surgery. I love being a PA. But I found out probably five or six years ago now that I looked around and wasn't very fulfilled and I needed something else in my life and a little less of other things. And so I have been on this journey to find out how to live a life that I want to wake up and get out of bed for in the morning. And along this path, I met Tracy and she has been integral in my growth and expansion and helping me along this journey. So I am so happy to be here today. Thank you for having me. We're so happy to have you. So tell us about this story of burnout. What specialty you were in before? What kind of led up to you saying enough is enough? I just can't do this anymore. So I was in CT surgery And it wasn't the first subspecialty that I did out of school. So I did orthopedic surgery. Then I had changed into just doing first assist in the OR. And again, I just, I love, love, love surgery. And a job came open in CT surgery. And I was like, yes, I can't wait. And CT surgery is amazing. I still think about it with like rose colored glasses. We get to stop the heart and start it. We get to work on the heart. We get to it is truly a phenomenon to see the heart beating in front of you and work on it and, and help people in that way. So in a way, when I look back surgery, you know, especially CT surgery was almost like a drug for me. And when I look back on, when I look back on it in that respect, I can see that the operating room for me was an escape. So I didn't have to deal with my family. It sounds awful, but I had two young kids at the time. I was running around like crazy. I didn't have to deal with my pager. Somebody else took it. I didn't have to deal with patients. All I had to do was focus on what was in front of me. And that felt wonderful. Hmm. When you have a million things pounding on you, it feels really good to only have to concentrate on one thing. And by doing that, I wasn't concentrating on all the other things in my life. So I was letting things fall away. I was letting my relationships, I wasn't putting energy into my relationships. So they weren't, um, progressing or, or becoming where they could be because I wasn't Mm -hmm. putting energy into them. I wasn't putting energy into myself. So my mind and body started to break down. So all of these things ultimately led about nine years into CT surgery after I tried to change within CT surgery, like have different jobs within CT surgery, led to me literally in the bathroom stall at work, crying, like bawling. I wouldn't say crying. I mean, I was bawling because one of my daughters had been diagnosed with ADHD and I didn't know how I was going to get her to the appointments that I knew she was going to need for this. And as a mom, I felt like that was a huge failure. Like my daughter was in third grade and failing, like blatantly failing. And how as a mom could I stand by and watch that happen and and not be able to get her to the doctor's appointments that she needed? And my other daughter, literally, I mean, like within like two days of each other, I picked her up from a camp. It was summertime and I picked her up from a camp and she was, she was bawling. 
And she's, I said, I said, honey, why didn't you call me? And she goes, mom, if, if I had called you at work, you would have yelled at me and you wouldn't have time to have picked me up. Ugh. And she wasn't wrong. And that was one of those moments where I was like, something's got to give. And it wasn't till the next day that I started breaking down and crying in the bathroom saying, I, I cannot do this anymore. I cannot live this way anymore. Something mm. has to change. And I literally walked out of the bathroom, wiping my tears and directly across the bathroom was a wonderful, wonderful woman who was kind of in charge of a lot of things in the department of surgery. I walked into her office and said, I need a new job. And I, and it's either going to be here at this institution or it's going to be somewhere else, but I can't do this anymore. And she said, we want to keep you here. We will find something. And so that's when it started. And it was probably about six or eight months later that I eventually moved into a position that I am in now and I really enjoy. But that was, that was the breaking point for me. Hmm. So it sounds like it was both gradual and seemingly all of a sudden. So this was building over time and you were kind of trying different things. Like I'm going to move around within the department. I'm going to try this or, you know, attempt to create a life that is okay within the constraints of this job. And then it reached a point where you're like, okay, it's, I can't, I don't want to talk to me about how that felt as a person who, I mean, CT is super fast paced. Like not everybody can do it. You know, PA school is aggressive. It, a certain type of person goes through that rigorous training and takes a job like that. How did you reconcile you raising your hand and saying, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. And I need some help with the person you identified with before that happened. It was awful. It was, I might, I might cry. So just bear with I already me. did when you were telling your story. Um, it was really, really hard. It was hard because I really felt like a failure, period, end of story. There was a lot of shame that came in that was that was my brain saying, you're not good enough. You've never been good enough. Look at you. You're failing. Um, why can everybody else do it and you can't? It was, it was, you know, all of the gremlins, all of the monsters coming out. Mm. And just saying, see, we're right. You were never all of those things we've been saying to you were yeah. right all along. And what's really funny about it, although as hard as it was and as much work as I've had to do to kind of work through those gremlins and, and work through my own stuff, it felt like a weight was lifted off of me when I made the decision. Mm. And through this process, What's interesting, again, looking back now, now that I'm in such a better place, it was never going to work. It was family is a priority and one of my part of my core values. And I was never going to be home for dinner. I don't know what it is about sitting down to dinner with my family that is so important mm -hmm. to me, but it is like one of those things that is non-negotiable that we try to do literally every night. We sit down and we eat together and everybody makes an effort to get there. And that is non-negotiable. And that was never going to happen in CT surgery ever, ever. No matter how many times I tried to fix it or change it or make it fit, it was square peg, round hole. You know, mm. it was not going to work. And I have a lot of clarity now to see why that wasn't working, but I didn't then. When you're in it, you mm. cannot see it. Mm -mm. So do you feel like you knew that things like family and being home for dinner were priorities of yours before you went into CT surgery? And then during that time you lost sight of them? Or do you feel like Maybe you kind of sort of knew they were values, but they didn't. Like now you're like, this is a non-negotiable. It happens at our house. We prioritize it. But it that wasn't what was happening when you were in this position. I think what happened, at least for me, is that I became a physician assistant first. And I fell in love with surgery first. And then kids came. Hmm. And I tried to fit them into what I already had established as my world. 
and it wasn't working. And then somehow I just thought I could make it work, right? I just thought mm -hmm. I could make it work. I thought I could be everything because I mean, honestly, that's kind of at least the story I told myself. And I think that a lot of women get that impression from, I don't know whether it's culture or our parents or what it's from, but it is that we can have a full-time job and be a mom and, you know, be home for dinner and get them to soccer and, and, you know what I mean? And, 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 right. Have a perfect house, have a great marriage. And there's almost, there's only so much energy that we have. Mm. And I didn't understand that that is a very finite resource and that we really have to focus it on what matters. And I think I let my job matter more for a while. And it didn't, when you aren't aligned with your purpose in life or what your, again, your core values are, it will never feel right. And I just, I didn't understand that because I think my values changed once I had kids and I didn't let myself either acknowledge it or believe it or I don't, I, I, I don't, I can't figure that part of it out, but I definitely tried to fit kids into my already mm. established life. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, when you say, and, and, and I think, well, women should be able to have it all. Why shouldn't we be able to have all the things? And I think what I thought when I was younger and less experienced and before I walked through burnout was that I had to have it all, all at once for it to count. Yes. That having this amazing career and then having kids and then letting my kids dictate me stepping away in some capacity, whether that's changing specialties or changing jobs or taking time off or going part-time, that if I was, if I was to do that, I was showing myself and everyone else that I couldn't still work full time and show up well for my kids and take care of myself and have a thriving marriage. And that that was reflective of my weakness or my inability when now that I've walked through it and now that I'm the other side, I think it took more strength for me to walk away than it did for me, all of those things I did to try and stay and make it work. I totally agree. So to the mom listening who feels like you're hanging on by a thread and you're saying, I want it all, you can still have it all, but you might not be able to have it all this week or this month or this year at the same exact time. I think Logistically, it just might not be possible. I, I, I can't tell you how much I, that resonates with me. I think one of the best things I heard was talking, a woman talking about having seasons of life and seasons just like, you know, the weather and nature change. And there's times when there's renewal and there's times when there's death. And when we look at our life and we, if we look at it in seasons, this is the season of my life where there might be a little bit of, I'm going to call it death of how much I'm working and a little bit more renewal of my family life. And then as my children head off to college and start their own lives, maybe there's some renewal of how much I work. Maybe there's not, but it's just a season. It doesn't last forever and it doesn't have to be predictive of the next season. Mm. And so that was one of those things that I heard that I was like, man, that resonates with me, makes sense to me that there's just different seasons. It doesn't mean good, bad, sideways. We're giving it those things, right? We're giving it those connotations of it's not, I'm not good enough if I'm not working full time, right? Or um, I'm not a good enough mom if I'm not home all the time. So we're giving it those connotations where it's just a season. And I think also the standard that I'm measuring myself against is likely a male standard, which I hate to say. It's like, you know, my dad had a full-time job and went to work and worked, you know, crazy hours. 
but he also had my mom at home doing all of the things in the house. So they both had jobs. One allowed him to be out of the house. So, you know, when you have a dual income family, which Phil and I both work, those responsibilities have to be shared and there has to be good conversations around how do we balance all of this and how do we readjust when seasons of life change? You know, having another kid's a big deal or, you know, when they go to college, like my sister-in-law is walking through just recently being an empty nester, right? And so this is a whole new season of life. So I just, that was one thing I heard that I really enjoyed. And I was, it helped me have a new perspective is just having seasons of life. Hmm. It is a much more beautiful and graceful way to think about life, that it is this ever evolving journey and that nothing is permanent. So if during this season, something happened, whether you had another kid or one of your kids got a diagnosis or your spouse has a massive project or promotion, or they're going to be traveling or your you know, work is asking you to do something, whatever is happening, all of those events are a really great opportunity to reevaluate if what you've been doing so far is sustainable in the upcoming season. Mm-hmm. Because as humans, we default to, it's always been this way. It's always going to be this way. And I also think we think if I ask to have some reduced, a reduced template at work where my, I'm seeing patients a little bit less and more admin time, so I'm not charting at home, that asking for help means that you've somehow failed to cope on your own, which may entirely be true, but it is not a failure of your own. Like this problem of burnout in healthcare is, as we like to say, multifactorial, right? So it's not just you. And maybe you don't have the greatest boundaries and maybe you don't have the greatest self-care strategies. And those are things that you can work on. But also in healthcare, we have a system that tells us that this is an altruistic profession, that you went into this because you wanted to take care of other people. And because you want to take care of other people, then you cannot care for yourself well. You have to sacrifice yourself for the good of the team, for the good of the patient, for the good of the hospital, for the good of the employer. And that is a culture that is a setup for burnout. So what's been your experience with medicine culturally and what it's telling you about how much you owe it or how much of yourself you should be giving to those around you? That's such a loaded question. I know. (laughs) Take it away. So especially working in surgery, it is you are on 24 seven. There's no doubt about it. It's patients come first. It is literally ingrained as you walk into an operating room and you have a six hour surgery ahead of you, you shut off from your body, right? I have to ignore every impulse of my body to go to the bathroom, eat all of it. You shut down anything, anything. Exactly. You shut down your body and you are there strictly for that patient. That patient takes 100% of your time and attention. And when you walk out of the OR, maybe that patient takes 90% of your time and attention. But it is your absolute duty, devotion, choice to have the privilege of doing surgery on these patients. That is what comes through in the messaging in our culture of medicine. What also comes through is that if you make a mistake, don't talk about it and you better be better next time. And we're going to criticize you and hold you accountable for all of these things. 
that maybe you absolutely had no control over that puts forth a lot of shame and blame. I mean, if you've ever been to a surgical morbidity and mortality, I literally think there should be a licensed clinical social worker in morbidity and mortality conference that when somebody says something, they say, I hear that there's educational points in that, but let's say it a little bit better so it can be received better by a learner who is petrified, is speaking in front of two to 300 experienced academic surgeons who also were mistreated during their bringing up through the ranks, right? So they so, earned it. They earned the right to treat those people poorly because someone did it to them once. Or that's what they learned and they don't know any different, right? They don't know how to speak to help learners learn in a way that's not be ashamed. Mm. Don't talk about this. Hide it away. Put your emotions in a box and let's move on. There is just a culture shift that needs to happen. And these conversations, bringing awareness to these things is what is going to move us forward. And people standing up and saying, I'm not going to be ashamed of this. I made a mistake. I may, I may have done something incorrectly, but that doesn't make me bad. Mm. And I can learn from this and grow from this and make sure that the next time I have this in my brain and I have learned how to take care of the patient better next time, which is all we're doing. And there's going to be mistakes. We're humans. There are going to be mistakes. Mm -hmm. So as you're describing that and you're saying, especially with surgery, but I think this is true for medicine as a whole as well. We are asked as providers to be able to separate our emotions from logic. So we're taking care of a patient and yes, they are a person and they have a dog at home that they're worried about or a wife or young children. And sometimes there's things that resonate more with us. I think for me, that has historically been when I see myself or someone that I care deeply about in the patient, whether it's their mannerisms or their social situation, whether they reflect me, you know, if it's a young mom or if it's, you know, a kid, all of those things I think hit deeper for me. And part of our profession is that you have to be able to separate that compassion and that personal connection with the patient in order to logically assess them, diagnose them, treat them, appropriately interpret lab results, all of the things that we're being asked to do day in and day out as we take care of patients. And we have to be able to separate our emotions. Yet, one of the symptoms of burnout is depersonalization. So we are working inside of a situation where it says, hey, you have to separate yourself. You have to depersonalize from this patient in order to do your job. Because if you cry and feel so, so, so upset every time someone comes into the ER with a laceration, you're crying all day, right? People are sick. They're coming in. You, you need to be able to function inside of this role. And in order to do that, you have to separate yourself from your emotions. But separating yourself from your emotions, separating yourself from that connection to patients is what leads us to be burned out. Busy working mom. I used to wear it like a badge of honor. Then I realized that I was drowning in to-dos and running around like a lunatic, all because this key piece was missing. I wasn't clear on what my deeply held values were. And when everything's important, nothing is important. Now that I've done the work and figured out what I value most, it makes life so much easier. Those core values serve as the compass for the direction of my life, and they inform my heck yes and my hell no responses to each and every opportunity. I've taken the process to curate core values and boiled it down into three simple steps. I've laid out the exact process to gain clarity so you can start applying your deeply held values to day-to-day -day life. To start living a purpose-driven life full of what you love and void of all that other shit, download your core value curator today. The link's waiting for you in the show notes. So what's very interesting is I'm reading this book and this was a neuroscientist, sorry, a neuroanatomist at Harvard that underwent a stroke. And so she studies the brain and she said, 
our senses go into our brain are, and are interpreted by our emotional brain centers before they go to our thinking brain centers. So in essence, just neuroanatomy wise, we are emotional brain, I'm sorry, we are emotional beings that then think. Hmm. So trying to separate our emotions from what we are doing is impossible. And I think when we try to function, again, not as our whole person, not as our authentic selves, not what we are physiologically set up for, of course it's going to cause burnout. And what if we were taught and what if we changed the culture of medicine so that we were taught that we're emotional beings mm. and how to work within that realm of being emotional? Maybe we do have to cry when there's a laceration walking in, but then the next 10 lacerations, we don't feel like crying. What if we were taught to embrace that we're emotional beings functioning in medicine where empathy actually, I think, connects us and helps us take care, better care of our patients? I think that there, you know, culturally needs to be some big shifts, systemically needs to be some big changes. And as a person who is working inside this system, I think it's pretty easy to say, this is just how medicine is. I cannot change a single thing. I'm just one person and this system is set up in a way that doesn't support me. And I'm just going to show up and do my job and go home and just kind of live my life. So what do you have to say to that person about both the things that they can do inside of their own life to improve but also empowering them to say in a meeting or get on a committee or do whatever they think is necessary to help change their system or their employer or their policies at their place of work. So what I will say, and when I say this, I'm really saying it to myself because every single day I come home and I think, why do I think I can change this? Why do I think me as one little tiny voice can change this huge system? And I will tell you this, that I have come against roadblock, against roadblock, against roadblock. But what I've done in my personal work has led me to have greater relationships so if you are a mom that has a conventional family, so I am married, I have a um, husband who, when I was burned out, there was a lot of resentment. There was a lot of, I felt like keeping score, not him not helping enough. Um, my kids, you know, I didn't feel like they did enough. As I have been on this journey and I have worked on myself, my husband literally has said to me, because you changed, I saw it and I changed. And somehow, and again, this is beyond my understanding or knowledge, somehow the changes I made have, I don't have the resentment. My husband actually does more than he has ever done around the house. My kids do more than they have ever done. And they're happy to do it something changed the energy in our house. I wasn't bringing home bad energy anymore. I was bringing more love in and things changed. So when you think that change can't happen, just start working on yourself. Just focus on yourself and trust that changes will happen. I then brought that energy to work and the microclimate that I have in work. Again, I can't change the huge system that I work in, but the microclimate that I work in is a good climate. I encourage the people and they encourage me. When I came up against roadblocks in my system for my well-being efforts, 
I then somehow worked myself into our state society and I've done more there than I've ever done for my healthcare system. And I am so supported there that they are getting me places at tables for bigger things, for national things. That is giving me, this one little person, a bigger voice, a megaphone. So it can happen. You can at least, even if you don't want to change things on a national level or a state level, you can at least change your microclimate, the place you live, right? Your family, your home, and what you walk into at work. It, that can happen. So talk to me about how your day-to-day is different now, whether it's how many hours you're working or your stress level at work in your new position as compared to CT surgery before you burned out. Okay. So I will walk you through a day of CT surgery and then I'll walk you through a day of now. So CT surgery starting at 7 a.m. So I would push the snooze button a million times because I wouldn't want to get out of bed. I knew exactly how many minutes it took me to shower and get out the door. So I, I had it timed. I think it was like 17 or 19 minutes that I could. <laughs> That's so specific. I, know, I, I knew exactly. So I knew exactly when I actually had to get out of bed. So my feet would hit the floor. The adrenaline would start pumping. I jump in the shower, go really fast, throw on my scrubs with wet hair, throw my hair up, get a cup of coffee, you know, make my kids lunches, be out the door, knew exactly how many minutes it took to get to work. God forbid there was a uh, uh, traffic, you know, so anything I'd be honking, yelling at people, get out of the way. I got to get to work, scream into the parking lot, go up, grab my loops and run down. So I'd be like sweating entering into surgery, which is never a good thing, right? Because your loops are going to fog. Like you're trying to get your gloves on, your hands are sweaty. So I'd, I'd run into surgery and then I'd be all stressed out in surgery because, you know, in, in heart surgery, I'm taking the vein that's going to go on the heart. And especially at a big academic medical center, we're getting the harder cases. So a lot of times the vein wasn't great. And so then I'd be worried that the vein wasn't going to be good enough for the patient. And I'd be so stressed. I mean, literally stress, 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 adrenaline, adrenaline, adrenaline. So then, you know, I go out from that and then it would be either more cases or consults or, I mean, running, just running, 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 running until, oh my gosh, my kids are going to be the last kids picked up at after school or daycare, whatever they were in, running out the door, hoping beyond hope that I was going to be on time to pick them up if it was my day or, you know, if it, so I'd, I'd pick them up and I'm, I have no energy left and I'm picking up two little girls that have a ton of energy. And all they want to do is tell me about mommy, mommy. I had a great day. I did this. I did this. The last thing I want is more coming in. Like I'm so dysregulated and there's more coming at me. And so I'm telling them like, basically be quiet, putting them in front of devices, doing whatever I can, because then I have to get dinner on the table. Right. And they're hungry. And then the crying starts and the tantrum start and you're getting dinner on the table. Then you're really, really dysregulated, really kind of pissed off. Right. And so then you're trying to do tubs and bath time, which is supposed to be soothing and it's not. And then getting them in bed. And then you're like, thank God I'm rid of my children. Right. That's, it, it's like the worst thought, but like, thank God they're, they're I'm rid of them. Yeah. And then you literally, I would just take a beer or a glass of wine and sit down and park myself in front of the TV from like nine to 11. And then 11 o'clock, I'd try to go to bed. My brain would be So I wouldn't get great sleep. I'd have a long time, you know, so anyway, and then wake up and do it all again the next day. Right. So never felt rested, never felt like I had any energy, just grinding out adrenaline all day long, all of it. Now I wake up voluntarily at 5 (laughs) a.m. to have a cup of coffee with my husband. And we, I very slowly wake up. It's very nice. It's gentle. It's how my body wants to wake up. I then talk to him about our day. He'll say, you know, like, what's the plan for dinner? Do I have to pick anything up? What are the kids doing today? Where do we have to, like, we make a plan for the day. And then I go up, take a shower, 
I then meditate after my shower and do some breathing exercises. I make sure the kids are out to door out the door. They have their, you know, they make their own lunches now. And I head into work or I work from home. I go, 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 go at work. It's still flat out at work. I'm not going to lie. That hasn't really changed. But at least I'm coming home a little bit earlier. And when I'm coming home, I understand that this is now my focus. So I will likely do something that helps me refocus my energy and not compartmentalize work. I try not to do that anymore. But if I have things to work through, I try to work through them on my drive home. I try to, you know, talk to myself. Yesterday was a heck of a day. And on my way home, I said, you know what? The day is done. You did everything you could today. And maybe it wasn't the greatest day, but when I walked through the door, I was calm. And that's very different than it used to be. And when my daughters came to me to tell me about their day, I was interested and engaged. Mm. It made me feel more calm. I, let's see, dinner last night, I was thinking about dinner and Phil said, hey, you know what? I have to run this errand. I'm going to be right near a pizza place. Why don't we just pick up pizza for dinner? Sure. Normally in the past, I would have tried to control and say, no, we have this in the fridge. We need to use it. I don't do that anymore. If he wants to volunteer to pick up pizza, hell yeah. Two thumbs no up. No problem. <laughs> Bring it on. I will sit and I will like decompress for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I edited some podcasts last night. I went for a walk. A lot of times my husband and I go for a walk together. His decompression last night was watching a movie. And my decompression was working on the podcast a little bit, going for a little bit of a walk. We reconnected before bedtime and bedtime is 8 30 9 o'clock we are in bed like like i am asleep by nine o'clock so my days start better end better they still in the middle are a little bit crazy but so much better so in listening to you tell that story it's interesting so we're recording audio right now we have a video on so we can see each other um for the listeners at home who can't see us and when you're recording audio there's these little waveforms that tell you how loud you're Mm -hmm. talking and sort of shows the cadence of how you're talking. And I wish I could show you like a picture of when you describe your day before, when you are burned out, you're talking so fast. You're talking so loudly, like almost like just talking about that brings up that adrenaline, that tension. And you're like, even when you're talking about it, you're just talking faster (laughs) because that's how it felt. It felt so stressed, like a runaway train, like things are going, 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 going. I'm not in control. I'm not in control. This is my life. It's happening to me. And repeat happens again the next day. And when you started talking about now, your voice quieted down and your cadence slowed down and your shoulders relaxed. And I can see (laughs) how differently the energy of you even recounting what that felt like, even though now you're a little bit removed from it, to how the pace and the grace and the cadence and the, you know, presence and peace of mind that you have now, as opposed to before. And so to the person who is feeling like their life is that runaway train. The other thing, Meg, that was really poignant to me in those retellings of before and after burnout. And as you've been recovering and working on yourself is how in the way that things are now, you're highlighting these calm opportunities for connection with the people that you love most. So this is the way that I connect with my husband in the morning. We reconnect again before bed. When my girls are telling me about their day, I'm in a place where I'm able to receive that feedback from them or receive that information from them and not give them scrappy leftovers because I left it all on the table at work. So do you really feel like those relationships have started to thrive in a way that was totally different from when you were burned out? Yes. Hands down, yes. My children used to, I kid you not, would flinch when I opened my mouth when I was burned out because they immediately thought I was going to yell. Mm. It didn't matter what they did. My voice was going to be harsh. It was going to be critical. 
And there are things I wish I could take back that I have mm. said to my, my family and my daughters. They now are so open and honest with me. My daughter, my 15 year old man, she teaches, they both teach me a lot, but my 15 year old, I was talking about my 13 year old and my 15 year old said, mom is, is, do you really think you connect with Ellie? And I said, I spend a lot of time with Ellie. You know, we talk about, you know, a lot of different things. We, you know, because I'm working on myself, I try to help them get set up for success in their lives. And, you know, I talk about the self-critic and, you know, how it can be very harsh and we kind of have to combat that voice. And she said, do you, do you really think you're spending a lot of time with Ellie? And I said, yeah, I do. And she goes, I don't think you are. And so this weekend, it was, it was interesting because it's hard for, for me to take. And I was like, I do, I do, you know, I'm getting kind of huffy. Sure I do. And what do you know? <laughs> this weekend, Ellie was, you know, kind of in a tough spot. And I said, you know, Ellie, do you want to spend some time just one-on-one -on -one with mommy? Like, do you want to bake next weekend together? And she got this like little, like half smile. And I was like, Ooh, she's like, no mom, I know you're busy. I know you have your podcast. I know you have, you know, and I was like, no, Ellie, like I am going to put it on the calendar. Do you want to bake something together on Saturday? And her face went to a full smile no, ma it's okay, mom. And I said, no, Ellie, like I'm putting this on the calendar. We're doing it whether you want to do it or not. <laughs> Full on smile. Thanks, mom. I love you. Thank you. If I hadn't listened to my 15 year old, if I hadn't been open enough to receive that, I never would have been able to connect with Ellie in a different way that I, I really thought I was connecting and spending time mm. with her. But maybe the time I was spending with her was time that was essential for her, but not fun mm. and doing something that the pressure is off the, it's not working on ourselves. It's not, you know, it's just fun. I'm just going to bake with mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think when we are burned out and we, when we are redlining every day, we miss those opportunities. We miss the whisper, whether it's in our own mind or someone we love whose opinion might kind of rub us the wrong way, but who tells us with some compassion, Hey, you're really not showing up well in this area of your life. And that's a really hard thing to hear, especially from a kid, but just in general from anyone who says, Hey, you really have not, where have you been? You haven't been present at work. We're, you know, we're really, you're not the same as you normally are. It's easy to take that feedback and write it off as like, what does that person know about me? They don't know me. I'm doing the best I can. And you can be doing the very best you can. And you can love your life and look around and say, oh my gosh, all of these things are blessings. This home, this family, these vehicles, our financial situation, and still feel burned out. Yes. Loving your life and being burned out are not mutually exclusive. You can love it. You can see that you are blessed and privileged and that you have been set up for success. And still you can feel burned out by the circumstances that you are walking through. Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. It's just, and it's happening. I mean, it happened to both of us and we're out here talking about it, but it is happening. If it's not happening to you, maybe one of your colleagues, maybe your spouse is walking through burnout. And I even just think listening to this and bringing it to the forefront of your mind, you will look around and see people who are struggling. So before we wrap up, Meg, what is your advice to the person listening to this who says, Hey, I feel okay. But maybe they go to work and they see their nurse is really struggling or their office manager is definitely drowning in all of these tasks. What can that person do to kind of support other people in their life who they see who are maybe like struggling mentally or having, you know, burnout symptoms? So I think there's two things that I really think are important. One Give them grace and give them an opportunity to talk about it. Make time and space for them. I know 
a lot of times talking about it, just getting it off your chest is huge and, and having a safe space to do that. And especially with somebody in medicine that understands your day is really a golden opportunity. So if there is somebody around you at work that you see is struggling, give them the time and opportunity to talk about it. Say, Hey, you know, I noticed you're off, or I noticed that, you know, you seem like everything is fast paced or, you you know, you don't have to say, I I see that you're struggling. Um, but give them the time and space to talk about it. Say, Hey, you want to, you want to go grab coffee or, you know, and give them an opportunity to, to, get it off their chest. Um, there may be a lot of things going on in the background that you don't know about and may help you actually function better at work when you know mm. your coworkers, what's going on with them better. The other thing that I can say is really show people by what you do, your actions speak louder than your words. If you take time off or don't answer emails after work, or don't answer in baskets in a frenetic way, people will take your lead, especially if you are considered a leader. Because we need leaders to be brave. We need leaders to show us the way. And you do that by your actions. They speak so much louder than your words. I can tell you, I have so many leaders that are like, yes, you need to take time off. You need to take time off. You need to take time off. And when was the last day they took time off? Mm, And mm -hmm. when was the last day? Like I get emails from them at nine o'clock at night. Not okay. Your actions are speaking, speaking, sorry, your actions are speaking louder than your words. Yeah. So set that example and set the tone in your practice or in your place of work for how you want to see others embracing those boundaries and really holding the line. And that is showing everyone around you that this is the way that you function and it doesn't make you less of a team member, it probably helps you to show up better at work that you are unplugged and that you have some boundaries that are clear and enforceable and communicated to other people that you are not going to be 11 PM emailing. It's not, unless you work night shift, you should not be answering an email at 11 PM. Correct. So Meg, thank you so much for sharing. I know that talking about these things is very vulnerable and, you know, you're saying, Hey, this was a season that was really hard and this is what I did to recover. And this is how my life has changed since then. So if people want to learn more about you or check out your show, where can they go to find you and all of the awesome resources that you've created for providers walking through burnout? Absolutely. So megletty.com is an easy place to go where you can pick up my podcast. I am megletty923 on Instagram. And my podcast and Instagram are basically where I hang out. I also do, you know, national lectures. So if you are going to a conference, start looking for me because I might be there popping up talking about burnout. And if someone wants to go search for your podcast and listen to the next episode. Now, the name of your podcast is burnout. What I've learned so far with Meg Letty. Nice. Alrighty. Well, thanks Meg. I really appreciate it. Thanks Tracy. I'm doing a victory dance right now because you did it. You took the time to tune in, to reach for a better life and to take care of you. Did our time together go by way too fast for anyone else? Head to fulfilledasamom.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's show. You now have the tools and knowledge to change your life. Go blaze your trail, take that step, make the shift, and do the work to create fulfillment in your life today.